Hello and welcome to Civics After School, Lesson 6, Politics in the Gilded Age. Uh, this video is best viewed as part of the U.S. History After School playlist. If you don't know how to access the U.S. History After School playlist, just go to the main page of my channel. There should be a link. Uh, I don't know. Somewhere down there. Um, and select the U.S. History After School playlist. This lesson follows Chapter 20 of the Totally Awesome, Totally Free OpenStax textbook. If you are not familiar with OpenStax, uh, you can see a link in the description of this video, which will take you to this totally free, totally awesome textbook. Also in consultation with the Gateway to American History Florida textbook to ensure that our lessons cover the Florida State U.S. history standards. Um, if you're watching in the playlist, the last video you saw in the previous lesson was uh, about Thorstein Veblen and the leisure class. I want to take just a moment, offer a couple last reflections on that before moving forward. Um, the Veblen video, the Veblen video uh, expounded on what you'll find in the very last section, uh, very last um, topic in section 19.4 of the OpenStax textbook, where we talk about growing critics of the way American society, culture, government, and life is being lived in the Gilded Age, coming not from outside, but from within. A growing sense of self-criticism about what it is to be a U.S. American. Uh, so I, I don't often offer my opinions on things to students. And when I do, I give a flashing red light. What you're about to hear is my opinion. So Good, honest, intelligent people are perfectly free to uh, disagree with everything I'm about to say. But I, I want to reflect for a moment on something that I think is one of the healthiest elements of U.S. American culture and really also of wider Western civilization that we don't necessarily find to the same degree in other cultures, other civilizations of the world. We spend plenty of time looking at the unhealthy elements of US American civilization. My goodness, um, under, under all of our feet are unknown graves of the native people that were wiped out to build this country on the backs of the enslaved African American people. There's plenty of time and plenty of reason to talk about American mistakes, American problems. But let me talk for a moment about something that is genuinely exceptional and positive about uh, U.S. American civilization, and that is our sense of self-criticism. There, uh, there is a willingness in the American spirit to not just point at the other guy, point at the enemy, point at the outsider, and say, you did this wrong, you did this wrong, this was your fault, he started it, mom but also to look in the mirror and say, wait a minute, are we being the best nation we can be, the best versions of ourselves that we can be? What mistakes have we made and how can we be better? You get pushback on that now. You'll get pushback of, some, uh, of folks who say, anytime someone tries to ask, what have we done wrong? How can we improve? It must mean they hate America. America, love it or leave it, they'll shout. And I agree with America, love it or leave it, 100%. But how does love operate? When, when we have friends or loved ones who have, who have self-destructive behavioral patterns, if you've got a close friend, uh, a family member, I hope I'm not re-traumatizing anybody who may be viewing this, but maybe, maybe struggling with a crippling addiction, alcoholism, drug addiction, um, uh, gambling addiction, is it the loving thing to say, hey, A-OK, -okay, keep up the good work, you're the best ever? Or is it the loving thing to say, my friend, um, we got to make some changes here? Uh, I, I think the, the, the tendency in, in the American spirit to be self-critical, to say, you know what, not everything we've done is great. Not every, more importantly, not everything we're doing is great. More importantly, not everything I'm doing is great. And how can I do better? How can we do better in order to be better? That tendency is the healthiest thing we have in the United States of America. And the so the social critic is 
uh, is, in my opinion, the, the the greatest patriot, the greatest lover of country. Now, uh, too much of any good thing is it always causes problem. Too many healthy cells growing too fast, we, we call that cancer. Um, the cancerous form of self-criticism is self-hatred. And so you will find at, while well, you've got the one extreme, you've got America can do no wrong. And the other extreme is America can do no right, self-hatred. Uh, the, the notion that, that the whole the the whole system is corrupt from the top down that it was that it was founded in order to be unjust that we must tear down our society tear down our culture burn it down and build something new from the ashes um you know uh, that 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 self-hatred is also sparked by this by the same honest good intention as a healthy self-criticism um so i think we also need to be aware that that that's a possibility that that needs to be avoided when an individual uh is is mired in self-hatred you know that that's often caused for medication or treatment um uh so much more so if if a movement of people within an entire nation uh, uh wants the nation to hate itself um but i would resist wholeheartedly those who who would point, who would paint every critic of American policy and American culture as an America hater. Um, as my main man, Aristotle, has so wisely taught us, lo, these many 24 long centuries ago, um, virtue is often found in the middle, the golden mean between self-hatred and uh, and the arrogant exceptionalism that imagines something is good just because our guys have done it is a, a spirit of self-love that is confident and strong enough to be self-critical. Okay, let's move on to the Gilded Age. The Gilded Age is a term coined for us by the, uh, the awesome Mark Twain. When something is gilded, it is not golden, it is gold-plated. And somewhere earlier in the playlist, we heard from, uh, don't know his first name, but Mr. Mr. Heimler, the, the, the social studies teacher with the uh, much better kept beard than mine, who compared it to a gold-plated turd. Uh, this is a period where wealth has been generated, luxury has been generated like never before in the history of ever, and yet scratch away the golden surface and it's seething with corruption and suffering. You can uh, perhaps compare Gilded Age American society to uh, somebody who meticulously cleans the outside of his toilet 10 times a day, but has never cleaned the inside or ever flushed. Looks nice, but you ain't going to want to lift that lid. Um, uh, the open stacks text and the gateway text will both uh, go into this in a lot more detail. Um, what this playlist is intended to do is give you a uh, give help you hit the highlights, and then we'll zoom in and look more closely on a few uh, key elements. There is, however, my friends, no shortcut around actually reading. You can't learn without reading, and if you struggle to if you struggle in your reading speed, if you struggle in your reading comprehension, if it's a massive struggle, and you're if you're if you're at our school, come talk to me and I'll connect you with who you need to talk to. If you're at any school out there anywhere, they'll have people there able to help you. If it's not so serious, it's just you haven't built the habits of being a reader. Well, there's there's no cure for that other than practice, but there's no way to learn without reading and there's no way to know without learning and there's no way to live well without knowing the unexamined life is not worth living, said my main man, Socrates, if we can trust any source that quotes Socrates. Um, in this lesson, we'll meet a series of very ineffective presidents, who each of whom barely won, had very little power, and used what power they had just to reward their friends. We'll meet, we'll meet this black box, Black bar is in the way, and you can't see the black bar in the video, so you think I'm insane. We'll meet President Garfield, who uh, who 
vetoed the Monday Act and signed into law the Lasagna Act. At least that's what that's my guess. And, you know, I don't actually know anything. And if you'll dig into your wallet or your purse and pull out a few of your thousand dollar bills there in the get off my screen there in the middle, you'll see President Grover Cleveland. He graces the thousand dollar bills in our pockets. Uh, he is the only man to serve as president two times non consecutively, meaning he served a full term as president, ran for re-election, lost. Came back four years later, ran for election, and won. Nobody else has ever done that, though at the time I'm recording this video, it's February of 2023. The 2024 election season is just now ramping up, and we've got a fellow who's attempting to repeat that, former President Trump, who served, uh, served a four-year term, was voted out of office and is uh, now running for re-election because they're eligible to serve two times. Uh, even if, if they live to be 10,000, those terms can be 10,000 years apart. You'll see that the weakness of the presidency and the weakness of the federal government is in large part due to corruption uh, as a result of something called the spoils system. We talked last time about machine politics on the city level. Uh, the spoils system is essentially mean machine politics on the national level where the government is more focused on winning elections and rewarding supporters. And you'll see how that plays out. And we will also, uh, will also be introduced to an important force in politics, both then and now, called populism. Populism emerges, uh, the root word populo, that is the people, uh, it emerges as a movement that is that is seeking to address the very real needs of American farmers who are being left in the dust after the explosion of cities. We'll meet the figure Williams Jennings Bryan, a, a, a genuinely honest and and ethical and trustworthy figure who is really fighting to better the lot of the farmers. But the shadow side of populism is that it also draws a sharp line of us versus them uh, that, that people still talk today. What's the real America? Um, is it a big, um, big city folk up in New York City ain't the real America? The real America's down here in the heartland. Well, of course, the real America. The farmers are the real America, but so are the city folk and so are the immigrants who just got here. So the shadow side of populism is that it often transforms into rabble rousing into mob rule, into uh, a spirit of anti-elitism, anti, which can then be anti-expertise. You'll learn all about that in the text and you'll take a closer look in the playlist. So what you're about to see, uh, the very next video in the playlist is an excellent summary from uh, Mr. Heimler once again on politics in the Gilded Age. Gilded Age. That'll be followed by uh, a a short look at Mark Twain and where he came up with the idea of the Gilded Age. We'll see a little bit about President James Garfield, who had a had an awful bad day, and then we'll hear Johnny Cash sing to us about that bad day. We'll take a look at the Civil Service Reform Act, uh, an attempt to clean up the corruption in government and to, I know this sounds crazy, but start giving government jobs to people who are capable of doing the job rather than people who are related to the boss. I got my job because my brother's the principal. So <clears throat> I'm not I'm not sure where I stand on uh, Civil Service Reform Act. Um, we'll take a look at a, uh, a populist movement known as Coxey's Army. We'll hear a bit of William Jennings Bryan Cross of Gold speech, and that will conclude this lesson. Stay tuned uh, next time for uh, what comes after Gilded Age politics. Is that um, Lady Gaga? No, the progressive area is up next. I'm Mr. Childers. This is Civics After School. Keep on watching through the next few videos in the playlist.